Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and ordinary men, they were amazed and recognized them as companions of Jesus. When they saw the man who had been cured standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. So they ordered them to leave the council while they discussed the matter with one another. They said, what will we do with them? For it is obvious to all who live in Jerusalem that a notable sign has been done through them. We cannot deny it. But to keep it from spreading further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and ordered them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in God's sight to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot keep from speaking about what we have seen and heard. After threatening them again, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all of them praised God for what, he, for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing had been performed was more than 40 years old. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Loving and gracious God, as we approach your word this day, we ask for open hearts and minds. Help us hear, help us live your word and will for us today, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. In 1777, the tide of the American Revolution had, had turned and, and not in a good way for the rebel colonists. After some early and surprising victories by the American soldiers, the, the British Empire had realized this skirmish taking place in North America was, was more than just an annoying little conniption fit carried out by uncivilized rabble-rousers, and they responded accordingly. They had also figured out that these rebels weren't fighting by the continental rules they were used to, you know, lining up neatly and orderly in rows and wearing brightly colored uniforms so they could be shot properly, that kind of thing. So, so by 1777, the British Empire had, had dispatched more troops and, and sent their most accomplished commanders, their generals, to, to head up the efforts to quell the revolution. And they'd seen success. Late that year, three of those main commanders, generals, convened to, to plan a military strategy to end the uprising once and for all. The numbers were on their side, and, and they were sure God was on their side too. And, and military historians looking back on the times are, are pretty sure they could have wrapped up the whole thing in a year or so if it hadn't come down to an argument, a dispute over strategy between those generals. On one side was a man named General Burgoyne. He, he'd landed with a large number of British troops in Canada in late 1776 and, and joined with those civilians loyal to the crown there who had fled from the colonies up to Canada and were now anxious to join with the British military in their efforts. He and a second general, Barry St. Leger, argued the best plan was to take those troops and begin a massive offensive south from Canada into New England, joined by the troops led by the third general, uh, William Howe, who had overtaken much of New York, including Manhattan. He would come from the south. The effort would, would cut New England off, and, and they would close out the war by gradually tightening the noose around those key states, resulting in surrender, uh, surrender likely in a in a pretty short time frame. But Howe, who had become something of a celebrity back in England based on his early victories, had a different idea. He was sure that he, with his troops, should instead leave New England to the other two generals and their forces, and instead head south to conquer Philadelphia and all of Pennsylvania. It was less of a strategic idea than a public relations one, ultimately. The power and resources for the revolutionary side were, were much more concentrated in New England, but, but there was a symbolism to conquering Philadelphia that Howe just couldn't let go of. After all, that was the upstart nation's official new capital at the time. That was where the Declaration of Independence had been written and signed. He could, he could just picture the glory that would come his way if it was known that he marched into the Pennsylvania State House, later renamed Independence Hall, retaking it for 
king and crown. The argument went on for days. And in the end, how won, sort of. But in the process, it's the British government that lost. And, and we are now no, known as the United States of America. At the end of the argument, it seemed like Burgoyne and St. Leger just couldn't stand the ego of Howe anymore, and, and they caved into his demands. He was going to take his troops and, and march on Philadelphia, and they, with smaller numbers than they felt they needed, would tackle isolating the New England states. Howe soon figured out he had way overestimated both the intensity and numbers of those still loyal to Britain in Pennsylvania, and also the overall population's commitment to pacifism, given their Quaker heritage. His efforts failed, as did the efforts to the north against New England, carried on by the other two generals. Many historians are convinced that if they had pursued the strategy that those two generals had proposed and, and how had gone along, it's not unlikely that we would be today enjoying some afternoon tea, playing rugby instead of American football, cricket instead of baseball, and calling Charles our king. But they lost the argument, and history bore out the consequences. It's obvious that Burgoyne and St. Leger hadn't read on the internet an article written collaboratively by several professors of psychology and business that's been circulating lately. It's truly gone viral. It's titled, How to Win Any Argument in Three Easy Steps. But it also, in a weird way, might look like that this council of temple rulers, the priests and others that Peter and John are appearing before in this morning's scripture, we collectively call them the Sanhedrin, that those folks did somehow manage to read these professors' strategy because they somehow seemed to follow it almost perfectly. Of course, given their lack of high-speed internet access, we know that's not the case, but still. Peter and John, as we talked about last week, after healing a paralyzed man who had been a fixture at the temple gate for decades, had taken the opportunity of the crowd's attention to once again preach the gospel to tell them about Jesus and whose name they had healed the man and how Jesus could bring healing and new life to all of them as well. Those a religious elite that they're now appearing before that Sanhedrin council have egos at least as big as General Howe and, and they don't like that these nobodies, in their eyes anyway, are stealing the attention, the adulation, the respect they're sure should be theirs alone. So Peter and John have been arrested, held overnight, since by Jewish law, a trial can only be held in its entirety during the daylight of a single day. And we have the encounter, the argument that you heard Kent read about this morning from Acts chapter 4. Let's follow this argument through those three win any argument steps developed by those modern day professors and, and see how it didn't quite work out in the end for the Sanhedrin. But I invite you, feel free if you want to anyway, to write down the argument winning strategy, those three steps. You can write it down in your sermon notes and, and try them out for yourselves. Say next time you're having a disagreement with your spouse or, or your boss or your kids or your coworkers, just don't tell them you got the strategy here at Tri Lakes. The first step in this argument-winning strategy, according to those professors, is to discredit your opponent. Make them doubt not just the validity of their side of the argument, but their very qualifications to be participating in the debate at all. And that starts in the very first verse of this morning's reading, verse 13. The council sees Peter and John and determines they're not properly educated. They're not fit to be appearing here before this esteemed group, and, and they're certainly not qualified to be spouting any theological statements to the public. That was the job of the priests and the scribes, and occasionally those over-the-top Pharisees, all, although they aren't even included in this esteemed group because they're just a little too radical, a little too adamant for their taste. Peter and John are from Galilee, which to the Sanhedrin simply means they're nothing more than uneducated country bumpkins. While almost all Jewish males, no matter what part of the nation they came from, were literate, they could read, and they had studied some scripture, they hadn't had the in-depth theological education of a priest or a rabbi or, or even what the upper-class Sadducee who was part of the religious elite would have had. Yet these two had been talking about the things of God, a kingdom of heaven, and, and this man Jesus, who the council thought they'd been rid of a couple months earlier. And worst of all, they were talking about resurrection. 
a belief that most of the Sadducees and many of the priests had long ago rejected, although most in the nation still believed it. And even beyond that, they claimed that Jesus himself had been resurrected and that he could somehow ensure that others would be as well. Annoying and distracting at best and heresy, blasphemy at worst in their minds. And worst of all, it was being proclaimed by these two incredibly unqualified bumpkins. They didn't deserve to be standing here before the Sanhedrin, much less preaching their faith to a gullible crowd. Check off the box for strategy number one and you're winning your argument. Send these undesirables, these unworthy men, out of our presence, they thought, in verse 15, so they can strategize about how to put a stop to this whole thing permanently. As they go into their sort of executive session, they move squarely on to strategy number two. Bring into the argument any distracting side issue, no matter how related or not, in order to bolster your case. So they whisper among themselves, in essence, hey, we've got a problem here. It's obvious they've done a miraculous sign in healing this man, and the people have seen it. They understand that something's going on here that God is involved with, but that doesn't matter when it comes to winning this argument, when it comes to preserving their prestige and authority and their power. We, we fallen human beings will go to almost any length, ignore any truth if it means preserving our power. In the 1950s, a, a young college graduate was hired from here in America to be headmaster of a charitable school in South America. He traveled to his new job. He met the man who was retiring that he was replacing and decided that he needed a car, a rarity in those days in that place, in order to maintain his authority. The retiring headmaster told him there actually was a car the school owned already. It was kept behind the house where he would be living, but it wouldn't start on its own. It had to be push started instead. Some of you remember those days when we could do that. He told the new man that he only used it to go to the big city a few times a year. And, and when he did that, he recruited a half dozen or so students to push him to get the car started in the village. And, and then he always parked at the top of a big hill in the city so he could roll it to a start there. He himself said he, said he hadn't found a car necessary within the small village where the school was. But the new guy disagreed. He was sure that a, a car would be an effective symbol of his authority, his power. Nobody else had one. It would garner him the respect he needed to do his job well. But the village was located in the flatlands. There weren't any hills to rely on. So, so instead, the new headmaster pulled the five strongest boys in the school out of class to accompany him all day, every day, to push start his car throughout the day. The teachers quietly protested that the boys would miss out on lessons. Their education would fall short. But the arrogant new headmaster determined that just being in his presence all day long would more than offset that. So for 10 years, every year, a new group of five boys was recruited to be his car pushers. They would miss school for the whole year, instead riding around with him wherever he needed to go throughout the day, sitting in the car, doing nothing while he attended meetings or whatever, and, and push-starting the car again when he returned. After 10 years, this headmaster was recruited back for a more prestigious job in the States, and he immediately jumped on it. He met his replacement and, and told him of his car and the push-start program and how critical it was to establishing the image of authority and importance he felt was needed to perform the job. He encouraged him to recruit a new crew of five car pushers and continue the practice. The new guy looked a little puzzled. He opened the hood of the car, rattled around for a few minutes, shut the hood and said, I think the only problem with the car was a loose cable to the starter. Let's try it now. Sure enough, it started right up. The truth was obvious just under the hood for anyone who would see it. But the man's obsessive focus on authority and prestige and power kept him, that headmaster and many others, from benefiting from that truth for a decade. We see that with the Sanhedrin, those esteemed men who are debating the fate of Peter and John this morning. The truth is right in front of them, but it takes a back seat, a far inferior level of importance to their own interests. What will we do with them 
They begin their private discussions in verse 16. For it's obvious to all who live in Jerusalem that a notable sign has been done through them. We cannot deny it. But to keep it from spreading further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. It's time now to move on to step number three and the modern day professors plan to win any argument whether or not the merits are on your side. Resort to simply claiming your authority and end the argument right there. And that's exactly what the Sanhedrin do in verse 18. We're the Sanhedrin. We're your superiors, civically, religiously, you name it, they imply. So they simply say, knock it off. Speak no longer of this Jesus to anyone. But there's a problem here that these powerful men, the religious elite, the Sanhedrin hadn't counted on. Peter and John understood that they were ultimately subject to a higher authority higher than those powerful men they stood before, than these men who had used their earthly authority to see to the execution of the man Peter and John called Rabbi and Savior and Lord. Whether it's right in God's sight to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot keep from speaking about what we have seen and heard, Peter says in verses 19 and 20. And in those 31 words, Peter wins the argument at least from an eternal perspective. I think this is what those who are younger and hipper than myself call a mic drop moment. The Sanhedrin have just been given the ultimate spiritual checkmate. They can't deny that God is involved in the healing, involved in what has happened to trigger the events that brought these two men before them. The scripture even reminds us in verse 22 of today's reading that the man was over 40 years old. People have seen him there. They, they've known the genuineness of his paralysis, his suffering for decades. The Sanhedrin can't just claim it's a scam, an illusion. They even acknowledge to themselves, out of earshot to the audience, of course, that obviously God is involved here. And they can't very well now just say something like, well, never mind that God thing. You need to obey us and not God. After all, they're seen as, they they view themselves as God's representatives on earth. So they threaten Peter and John again. Tell them, you'd better listen to us and shut up about this Jesus stuff. And they send them on their way. That's all they can do for a couple of reasons, actually. First, Judaic law at the time prohibited punishment for a non-capital religious offense without first giving an official warning. So if nothing else in their eyes, this at least counts as that warning. And secondly, and more pragmatically, their hands really are tied. This whole incident stems from a miracle, a sign as Luke labels it. And and the people of Jerusalem would see punishing Peter and John for that as disrespect for God and his working in the world. Maybe the Sanhedrin seem to think if these two uneducated troublemakers don't heed their warning this time, They can do something harsher in the future, and and they do. But for now, their hands are tied. They followed perfectly those three steps to win any argument, but they still lost. The more powerful, the more articulate, the more educated side lost because they failed to truly understand, truly consider that being on God's side, truth's side, love's side matters more than any earthly strategy. And Peter and John Really, the early church and and the proclamation of the gospel won the argument. They won because they understood that the struggle ultimately wasn't theirs. God is the ultimate authority. And God's Holy Spirit is the guide within us, leading us to be agents, builders of the kingdom of God that Jesus spent his three years of earthly ministry proclaiming. And in the end, God doesn't call us to be successful. God only asks us to be faithful. Because the struggle, the battle, the argument, the results truly belong only to God. Donner Atwood writes the account of a a father and his young son who were out on the streets of London during the days of the World War II German Air Air Force's relentless bombing blitz of that city. As they were headed home one evening, the air raid siren sounded and and the father looked around for a sign indicating a shelter, a, a basement, a subway station, somewhere designated for safety during those attacks, but he couldn't see one anywhere near them. 
but he could see, hear, feel the, the bombs coming closer. So in desperation, he climbed down a ladder into a drainage pit on the street, telling his son to wait up top until he knew it would be okay. As the bombs exploded closer and closer, he, he reached the bottom and called up to his boy in desperation, jump, there's no time for the ladder, jump. But the boy, understandably, was scared, really scared. He just yelled back to his father, I can't, it's dark, I can't see you. I don't know where I'm jumping. His father just replied, I'm here, I can see you, and I know where you're going, jump, I've got you. And with that, the boy jumped at the last possible moment, landing safely in his father's arms, both of them living to tell the tale. That's really a metaphor for the Christian life. And in this last sermon in this series, looking at the early church and the first Christians in the first part of the book of Acts, I'll say it's a, a description of them as well. And I'd even say it's an apt description of where we find ourselves today in our world and our church with our own faith. We're going through things in our world, experiencing changes in our church that we've never gone through before. There's fear, there are threats surrounding us, and there's pain and loss too, but, but more importantly, there's hope. There's a future. We're, we're promised that by Jesus himself. And best of all, there's our faith that teaches us, that reminds us always that even though we don't know the future, we know who holds the future. So we can jump. We can move forward. We can move forward in faithfulness because our Lord knows where we're going in each and every way. And that's the best assurance, the highest hope that anyone can have. Amen. Let's pray. O oh, loving and gracious God, we pray that you might give us, give us a faith, a faith that helps us see hope, a faith that gives us the assurance that you know our future. Help us, God, walk bravely, jump bravely into a future even if it's unknown. Help us trust your Holy Spirit to guide us. Help us trust, trust your providence to lead us into our eternity. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.